come back to in a few minutes. But uh, next, on to Majid. Thank you, Alan. I'm going to ask everybody to indulge me for a second. I want to play you something. But before I do, I want to issue with a warning that it's going to be uh, distressing for some of you. Talk about activity of those people. There will be always, yes, it is freedom of speech, but. And the turning point is but. Why do we still say but when we... I do apologize if that distressed anyone in the room. That is the audio from the Copenhagen shooting. And the shooter chose chillingly the moment to let loose a volley of shots just as the speaker was making the point that when people pretend to defend freedom of speech, they caveat it with the word but. And he decided to choose that moment to let off the shots. He then went, as we all know, to a synagogue and killed some innocent Jewish people. Before that, it was in France at the kosher shop. And before that, it was in Belgium at the museum. And I really want to first of all congratulate all of you for being here today, because that was a cafe. This is a synagogue. They had security outside the cafe. They had, in fact, they had close protection for the cartoonist. And yet, despite that, this incident occurred. And so it could just as easily occur in London, it could occur here at this very synagogue, and the sheer fact that all of you are here this evening is a testament to your own bravery, to your own courage, to your own determination, to say, to refuse to cower in the face of this terrorism, and to say, by voting with your actions and your feet, never again. Because something we learnt after the rise of Nazism in Germany was of the, the danger of the banality of evil. What we learned is that if we allow ourselves to sleepwalk into an atmosphere in which people feel uncomfortable to speak their minds, in which people are slowly taken out group by group, one by one, and this sort of obfuscation that we've just heard is used, instead of calling a spade a spade, people say, it's, it's not anti-Semitism, it's community tension. It's not about freedom of speech, but if we allow ourselves to sweep, sleepwalk into that climate without standing firm and strong and drawing a line as we are doing here this evening, drawing a line in the sand and refusing to be coward, then before we know it, it will be too late because the question that we were uh, uh, here to address this evening is, are we, have we reached crisis point? Well, I'll ask you to answer that question based upon the recording that you've just heard. If in Europe today, people are speaking in synagogues or in cafes or in libraries, and they're talking about freedom of speech as the subject, or about anti-Semitism as the subject for discussion that evening, and they feel scared to even enter the hall because they're worried that somebody's going to attack them merely for speaking, then I'd argue that that is a level of crisis point because the very foundation of democracy is, it rests upon a few points. One of them is the right to express yourself because without the right to express yourself, you cannot campaign for the political party you represent. You cannot go and vote for the one for the party of your choice. You cannot hold the, those uh, uh, in authority above us to account for their mistakes. All of that rests upon freedom of speech. And then secondly, to protect the minorities. Because as we've just heard, we must judge the worth, the merit of any society by how much it protects those who are the most vulnerable within it. My own journey to, some of you may know, I spent 13 years on the leadership of an Islamist organization. And my own journey, to that organization began because of my own teenage black and white interpretation of the, Jesnia, uh, of, the, of the genocide in Bosnia against Muslims and of the domestic racism I faced at home in Essex where I was born and raised. 
We were chased down the streets. This is a year before the murder of Stephen Lawrence. And we were chased through the streets by a neo-Nazi paramilitary organization known as Combat 18. Some of you may have heard of them. Uh, they, were, uh, uh, they were chasing us with uh, screwdrivers and with knives and with hammers. But there was one man who I refer to in my, uh, in my book who I've never met since. And it's important to tell this story because it's why I'm here tonight. And it's in honor of that one man. I don't know how he's doing today. I don't know where he is. But I hope he's doing well. And I, I, I tried for the life of me to remember his name when I was writing my memoirs. And something in my head told me his name was Matt. So I decided to call him Matt. And I, I apologize to this man if that wasn't his name. But I found myself on one occasion surrounded by a bunch of neo-Nazi thugs. Uh, and they had hammers and they had screwdrivers and they were about to uh, literally beat me to death. I was 15 years old. And this man came running from across the street. I'd never met him before. And uh, he was larger than me. And he stopped them all. And he said, what are you doing? This is a, he's a child. He's a, he's a kid. Why are, you, why are you attacking him like this? And they turned to Matt and they said, you must be a packy lover. And then what they did is they proceeded to stab and beat Matt all over his body and force me to watch. And that man saved my life that night. And it's the reason I'm here today. Because what helped me leave my own anger and hatred behind was of, because of the actions of people like that. So when we hear the audio that we've just heard at the beginning of what I've just played, what I'd urge everyone to remember is that we have to draw a line in the sand. The solution isn't to leave Europe. Europe is your home. You belong here as much as everybody else. And if anyone on this panel has anything to do with it, we will continue to say never again. We will continue to speak out in your defense, even if it means at risk. Because we know the consequences of what happens if we allow that line in the sand to shift and move to a point where it's unrecognizable. And I will end by saying that, of course, we have to acknowledge where the threat is coming from. President Obama gave a speech yesterday, and I fear, I fear that he is succumbing, and we all succumb, to what I've been calling of late the Voldemort effect. If anyone's read Harry Potter, you know what I'm talking about. Where he who must not be named, we're so scared of naming the threat that it increases the hysteria. We're dealing proportionately, proportionately, not only by the assessment of our security services, but also by all the statistics that look into this and by the monitoring services, anti-Semitic attacks are proportionately far, far, far higher. It's not even one level higher, three times the level of attacks against Muslims. You know, they are far higher. And proportionately, the risk to the safety in our societies, we have to be frank and candid about this. They come from the threat of jihadist attacks. They do not come from, proportionately, from far-right neo-Nazi extremists wanting to blow up synagogues and what have you. That is a challenge, it is a threat, but I'm talking about proportionately where the focus of the main problem is coming from. So when President Obama gave this speech, he said, you know, we will not allow these people to, to claim they are religious leaders, they have nothing to do with Islam. No, they are not Islam, the Islam, of course they're not, nor am I, nor is anyone really, because Islam is what Muslims make it. But they have something to do with Islam. They have something to do with it. If you're gonna argue with one of them, and I do all the time, um, you're not discussing Mein Kampf. You're discussing Islamic texts. They have something to do with Islam and the danger of not naming it, what I call the Islamist ideology. And just to bet one sentence, what is Islamism? Islam is a religion. Islamism is the desire to impose any version of that religion over society. It's the politicization of my own religion. What is jihadism? The use of force to spread Islamism. The danger of not naming this ideology is twofold. Firstly, within the Muslim context, those liberal Muslims, reforming Muslims, gay Muslims, feminist Muslims, uh, dissenting voices, minority sects, the Ismailis, the, the Shia, the, the, all these different minorities within the minority of the Muslim community are in, immediately betrayed. How are they betrayed? Because you deprive them of the lexicon, the language to employ it. 
against those who are attempting to silence their progressive efforts within their own communities by not naming the ideology. You surrender the debate to the extremists, and, 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 and actually what happens as a result is, uh, is, is they hijack the debate, they monopolize the discourse, and communities divided even further apart, rather than bringing people together, even though the intention of the President Obama was to, to try and bring people together. The second danger is in the non-Muslim context. What happens if you don't name the Islamist ideology and distinguish it from Islam? President Obama in his speech said, there's an ideology we must challenge, and he didn't name it. So, think about it. You're sending out the message to the vast majority of, Amer of Americans, there's an ideology you must challenge, but then you don't tell them what's it called. What are they gonna assume? The average American's gonna think, yeah, I've gotta challenge an ideology, it's called Islam. You're only going to increase anti-Muslim hatred like he who must not be named, you'll increase the hysteria, the Voldemort effect, I call it, by not naming the ideology because the average guy out there will then assume the president is talking about the religion itself. But if you distinguish Islamist extremism and say, look, Islam's a religion, we're not gonna tell you what good and bad Islam is, we're not gonna define that for you. What we can say is you mustn't try and impose that on anyone else. If you do, that's called Islamism, the ideology, and that's what we have a problem with. Unless you make that distinction and isolate the people that you're challenging, the average non-Muslim out there in the world who doesn't know that will think, yes, we've got a challenge, the religion, all Muslims are bad, let's drive them out of Europe. So actually, it doesn't do us any favors not to name this ideology. And with that, I'll end because I have someone far better than me who's waiting to speak.